Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jean Frossois and uh, I will talk about hacking Docker. Uh, this is my first conference talk ever, so uh, bear with me a bit. Um, so, I noticed that most speakers didn't do this because, well, they always copy the same slide, but I didn't have a slide to copy, so I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, so, I'm a system engineer, but I also like to uh, code and design websites sometimes. I'm also very interested, of course, in cybersecurity <coughs> and penetration testing. Uh, I graduated at uh, Hochschule Gent uh, last year with a Bachelor in Computer Science. And right now I'm working at Dimension Data Belgium, but I'm actually outsourced to Eurocontrol to m help manage their network. So, uh, first of all, a disclaimer. Uh, everything you see here is for educational purposes only. Um, pen testing and hacking without explicit permission is, of course, illegal. You shouldn't do it. Uh, I'm also not responsible for anything you guys would do after this talk. I'm not going to end up in jail. That's uh, your responsibility. Uh, also, I'm not yeah, the best hacker ever. I just graduated college. I, I did some research and I started doing some stuff. So obviously, not everything I do might be the easiest way to achieve <coughs> the goal I want to achieve. Pen testing is also not an exact science, so there could be multiple ways to, well, multiple exploits to actually get the same result. Uh, also, the IP addresses you see in some of the screenshots uh, will not always be uh, accurate because I did uh, my recording in two sessions um, because of time and work and stuff like that, so uh, they were different IPs. So, uh, meet today's target. Uh, this is the VM. Uh, that is hosting the, the Docker containers. Um, I do not have any credentials for this, so that's the goal of today, to get root access into this machine. Every good penetration tester should have a plan of attack. Um, I forged my plan of attack by just doing research. Uh, I, I will not say that my plan of attack is the best plan of attack there is out there, but that's how I do it. So uh, first of all, I do host discovery. Uh, and uh, right after that I do service discovery. The reason why I split those two is because when you combine them and you have a large network, there will be a lot of TCP IP congestion. Uh, network engineers will start noticing that their network is running slow and they will try to investigate faster what's happening and then they will see there's something fishy going on with the network. Uh, when you do it like this, separate it, of course there's also going to be still a lot of traffic, but it's going to be split in two, so it's a, li it's a little bit less. Uh, after I did that, I will try and do some enumeration, so I will then know, uh, because of my host and service discovery, what kind of operating systems there are in the network, what services are running, like web applications or DNS, external DNS, internal DNS, it depends on how far you can go in, into the network. Uh, then I will try to exploit the services I find, and when that happens, I will most likely get into the machine and from that machine I will also try to enumerate into other machines because it could happen that once you have an, a way into one machine that machine has other access or privileges so you can exploit further than you were on your originally, original uh, attacker machine. Uh, after that you can do some post exploitation which will persist your access after the attack but I will not go into details here because that's more grey hat, black hat hacking, and that's not the intent of, the, of this talk today. Uh, also, what I should mention before is um, I will not do any live demos today because it's my first conference talk ever. I would, didn't want to pray to the demo gods because demo gods could be uh, very bad-minded and the demo could fail. I didn't want to, uh, to risk it, so I recorded everything uh, beforehand. Uh, but I will, of course, do some explanation while the, the screen is running. So, first of all, uh, as you saw in the plan of attack, I would normally do a host discovery, but this time this is not necessary because uh, the VM I booted up advertised its IP address to me, so I already know what target IP is, uh, is my target, so the only thing is left for me to do is figure out what services are running on that machine, and uh, I use it to nmap for that uh, with the flags SV uh, because that will uh, probe the open ports and try to figure out what services are running behind uh, those ports. And you can see that in, uh, in this GIF. Uh, it might be a little fast, uh, but you can see 22 and 8000 were open. 22, of course, is SSH. And the web service 
is most likely 8000. Uh, it could be something else, but I guess it's, uh, it's a web service because um, Nmob showed me it was uh, Apache. Um, also, web services are most likely the point of entry of most penetration tests. And I don't just say this because it's me, no. There is actually research uh, done of this. Uh, I don't know if I can show it to you. This is work with drag mechanism or something. Yeah. Oh, damn it. Uh, so I don't know, uh, by the raise of hands, how many of you know OWASP? Okay, that's nice. Uh, so OWASP is basically the top 10 of uh, abuse, uh, abusing web applications. Uh, so that uh, includes cross-site scripting, SQL injection, stuff like this. And uh, there was actually a survey, this is actually from 2015, so it's already a little bit dated, but I couldn't find any more recent numbers. Um, they, uh, there's a consulting uh, company that asked their penetration testers uh, of how many percentages um, of their initial tests cost um, well, a way in, and obviously you can see it's quite a lot. Uh, financial services is like 58%. I think that's quite a lot for financial services. Come on, it's banking and stuff like that. And uh, government, 76%. And even healthcare is almost 70%. So I think those numbers are amazing. So uh, what I do after this is I will check what the website uh, show me. You can do this by just automating uh, the crawling uh, experience, which you can do with Derp. I don't know how many of you know Derp. I guess a lot of, of you. Yeah, not really that much. So uh, Derp is basically a tool that is uh, baked into Kali. Kali is the most used um, pen testing Linux distribution. Uh, and what it does is basically it will try and crawl the website with a, a word list that um, Derp already has. It works a bit like the same way as uh, the Google Spiderbot does to index websites on Google search. Uh, and it will list all the directories on the website, even the ones that are supposed to be hidden. So, um, And that way you can find hidden folders, try to log into them, stuff like that. Uh, but what I like to do first before I do Derp is just check the website and see what I can find manually. So I did. Uh, as you can see, it's another IP. As I told before, it's because I did it in two sessions. Uh, so behind port 8000 was this website. It says, not so easy Docker, and I don't know if you can read it, but it says here, just another WordPress site. Now, WordPress, I don't know how many of you know this, but WordPress is quite notorious of having exploits. Uh, there is a website called ExploitDB. ExploitDB is a list of most exploits um, that are being used by hackers and uh, penetration testers, and they just crowdsource it. So you can look in ExploitDB, find, for example, WordPress. I can show you maybe an example, but maybe I can do it after the presentation because otherwise I have to do the screen thing again, and it's quite annoying. So if you type in WordPress in VolumDB, you will find over 1,000 known exploits. Uh, which is quite a lot. Not all of them are for the core of WordPress, of course. You have plugins as well that uh, provide you a way in. Uh, the exploits can be found manually or yeah, with automation. As I said, Derp can be used to web crawl. Or we can just use WP Scan, which is a tool that is specifically um, built for WordPress exploiting. Uh, in this uh, GIF, I uh, launch my WP scan on the target. Um, yeah, it just enumerates uh, the, tar the, the website. It says no plugins found, so that means that we, won't, we will not be able to run any exploits on plugins. Uh, however, we did find some interesting headers, uh, one of which is here. It's basically exposing the API of WordPress um, for the WordPress website which is uh, not a very smart thing to do, but hey, this, uh, this machine did it. Uh, so as I said before, we found no plugins, so we cannot do any plugin uh, exploitation, but we found an API. And if we go to the API in the web browser, it will look like this. 
obviously this is not quite readable, but uh, you will manage. Uh, and obviously there is documentation because APIs, APIs usually tend to have documentation, it's WordPress. So if you would go to that website, it will give you a nice little curl uh, that will show you the users of the WordPress. And I will demonstrate this right now. So I do the curl request and I pipe it to a Python module because it's JSON to make it more readable. And I find a name Bob. So Bob is a user of WordPress. That's nice. Here you see Bob. It's Bob the Builder. Uh, Bob, how secure is your password? So we already know a user. We have Bob. So that takes care of one of two uh, things we need to log in. We need a username and a password. If you would uh, if you wouldn't have any username or any password, then brute forcing would be quite difficult because you would have to guess the username and the password at the same time. Chances of that happening with the current CPU, eh, it's, it's quite low, especially if it's a long password. Uh, but we have a username, so the only thing left to do is just, brute, uh, just a common brute force attack with a word list that you can find on the internet. Uh, you have several tools to do that. Uh, Burp has a, a built-in um, brute force module, but you have even WP scan has a built-in um, brute force module and Hydra. Hydra is actually my favorite tool to do this because Hydra can be used not only for uh, WordPress, but for a lot of things like uh, remote desktop, Telnet, SSH, stuff like that. But the easiest way to do it is with WP scan and I will do it now. <sighs> WP scan. I, uh, just gave my um, username Bob and a word list that I found on the internet and it will try to brute force Bob with the word list I provided and ta-da! We found the password of Bob. It's just welcome one. This is the command I used for it. So WP scan the URL which is just the WordPress site. Uh, the word lists just a word list I downloaded on the internet uh, and the username which was Bob but you can also uh, try to brute force the username with a, uh, with a word list just like you do with a password and the amounts of threats you want to dedicate on the brute forcing attack. The drawback of this method is that it's WP scan, the word says it itself, it's just WordPress so you cannot use this module for anything else than WordPress. The harder way is Hydra. I post uh, hi the hard way Hydra because Hydra takes a bit longer to just learn the syntax. It's not just word list, word list and URL and stuff like that. But as you can see, it gives the same result. It's welcome one. Uh, so as I said before, it's a bit harder to learn, but you can use it for a lot more than just WordPress. And this is the giant command that I used for Hydra, that's why I said it was a bit harder to learn. It's just Hydra, the module, the IP address S8000 because WordPress is running on 8000. Uh, the, the V stands for verbose, so it will show all the passwords it attempted in your terminal. Uh, smaller case L because we already knew the username, it's Bob. Uh, uppercase P because we will use a word list for the password. Uh, the path to my uh, best15.txt file, which is my word list I used. Uh, HTTP form post is the module of Hydra that we used to um, brute force WordPress. And this whole, scr this whole string, we can, actually, um, we can actually conduct this with burp by just sending a request. I will show that in the next screen. And it will give you, uh, in the HTTP header, it will give you this. But of course, this will not say user, and this will not say pass, this will say Bob and the password I tried to, to use. Uh, when you do the uh, uppercases, user and pass, it's the wildcard and Hydra knows it should fill in the username and password on that, uh, that location. And here I test uh, for failure because if you do a fail, um, it will display an error message and one of the words in the error message is incorrect. You will not have this when it's correct, that way Hydra knows when it's successful or not. And as you can see here, but I don't know if you can, because the quality is not that great, but uh, this is the traffic I intercepted when I tried to log in with, uh, on WordPress with, uh, with Burp. So Burp actually works as a proxy. 
you can block the traffic, it will send the HTTP request to Burp, and you can inspect in Burp. It's a bit like Wireshark, but for HTTP requests. Um, so, as you can see here, the log, Bob, password, I just write hello. And this whole, sc this whole string, I just copy paste it uh, f into Hydra. So, we found the username Bob and the password welcome one. We can log into WordPress. What can we do now? Well, uh, as you can see, the, uh, or maybe not because, again, the resolution, but uh, in my WP scan, it said no plugins, right? So, there were no plugins activated. But I can see there are two plugins on the WordPress itself. It's just in disabled state. One of which is the anti-spam, and the other one is the Hello Dolly. Uh, you can try and input uh, your uh, reverse PHP shell into this, and it will work. But what I like to do is um, just edit the theme, and uh, I will insert my reverse PHP shell in the 404 page. This way, the WordPress will still work. It will still say everything it does. Nobody will notice until they try to go to a URL that doesn't work. It's a 404 page. Uh, that way, um, the PHP shell will not say anything. It will just keep loading the, the web page. But since it's an URL that doesn't exist, most users will not notice this and will just try to go back to the original WordPress. And it's, it's just a way cleaner method than trying to edit this. And then the whole website will not be accessible anymore. So I was talking about uh, a PHP reverse shell. Uh, by the show of fans, who knows what a reverse shell is? OK. Um, so a reverse shell, uh, it works like a regular shell, just the reverse of it. Duh. Um, in a normal shell, you will have a client and a server. You will send commands on your client to the server. Server will execute commands. However, in a reverse shell, you have a way into the, in the, into the server, and you execute commands on the server. Server will reply back to your client. So you're executing commands on the server, not on your client. There are several ways to establish a reverse shell. I just use the PHP one because WordPress uses PHP. Uh, here you can uh, see it a bit. Uh, so in the 404 templates of the team of WordPress, I inserted a PHP reverse shell. It says here, change this, which is quite obvious. This is the IP uh, of your attacking computer. This is the port you want to send the PHP reverse shell to. So what you do is you upload this, you go to the 404 page on uh, your browser, and you set up a listener on your attacking computer on the same port. Once you access the 404, the PHP shell will uh, fire, and you will be in to the machine itself, to the server itself. As you can see here, I am now into the Docker container of uh, the WordPress. Um, and who am I? I am just www.data. Of course, this is a Docker container. So for exploitation use, it's a bit hard because you have no wget, you have no vi, you have no text editor, you even don't have any package manager, you have nothing. However, what you do have, at least in this container, is AP address. So you can, uh, you can advertise the AP address of uh, the Docker um, container. This is different than the VM because Docker uses a specialized network. It's not the same as your... Um, Docker host, it's a, it's a network that Docker uses internally to communicate with other containers. Uh, so you have this and you have curl, which is enough for me because I made two scripts. I made a host scanner script, which uh, does the same as nmop. It will just uh, do a host scan of the, uh, of the network and check which uh, hosts are alive or not. And I made a port scan. Port scan, same. It will just check which ports are open and which are not. Now the challenge is, how do I get these scripts into the container? Well, it's actually quite easy. With Python, you can, um, you can start a simple HTTP server. This will uh, let your computer act as a server. And with curl, you can download from servers. So I just inputted uh, my, um, my scripts into a load days folder on my attacking computer. As you can see here, the IP scan and the port scan are there. And I started the simple HTTP server. What I did on the container is I went to the temp folder, because the temp folder is usually the folder where you have access to execute stuff uh, when you're not root in containers. 
and I just downloaded uh, the things I serve from my attacker computer. So now I have two scripts in my Docker container, which are basically doing the same as Nmop. Once I had uh, these scripts in my container, I ran the IP scan and I found that uh, the .1, .2, .3 and .4 were the hosts that were alive in the network. But the .4, uh, a few slides earlier, uh, you can see when I did AP address on the Docker container, the .4 is actually the container we are in now, so we don't have to check this one. But we do have to check the 1, the 2 and the 3. And we do that with the port scanner. So I uh, scanned the host with port scan and I saw that in the dot one container port 22 is open, port 8000 is open, port 22 is usually used for SSH, 8000 is usually used as an alternate port for 80 and this uh, is a usually web service. Uh, on the dot two, uh, 3316 is open which is usually a database port and uh, on the dot three, 22 was open and 8022 was also open. And this last one uh, was one that got me curious because 80 is usually used for web services. 22 is usually used for SSH. And I thought 8022 maybe, just maybe, they were stupid enough to create a website with SSH, so serving SSH over HTTP. And I checked it out. So I said this already. I also, ah no, I did not say this. So uh, in the previous slide, you saw that port 80 was op uh, port 8000 was open in the dot one host. I just curled that one because curl was available in the container. It was just another WordPress site. So, okay, I curled 8022, however, and this showed me something very interesting. It showed me, obviously, HTML. Title: Docker SSH. Hmm, interesting. I also saw. I don't know if you can see it here, yeah, in the CSS, <laughs> cursor blink true. So I thought, hmm, maybe this is an SSH over HTTP. Now, how do we access a website that is not running on the Docker container we are in? We, don't, we are not in the same network as our uh, attacker IP, so we have the, I the network of my attacker IP, you have the network of Docker, we are inside the Docker container right now, and there is a web service running on one of the adjacent Docker containers. We want our attacker PC to visit this URL. How do we do that? Well, it's actually a trick I learned from one of the guys sitting in the first row. It's you, Christoph. Uh, I just set up a reverse SSH tunnel. So I mapped 8022. <laughs> I mapped 8022 um, on the Docker container to 8022 pointing to the outside, uh, and in order to do that, I had to upload an, an open SSH pun dep, uh, which I just downloaded, and then I executed this command uh, to have an Arizaki. I copied the Arizaki from this Docker container into my attacker PC in authorized keys to establish an SSH connection into the Docker host, and because of the port forwarding, and here you can see cut authorized keys, it's the same key, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, this is the command I used. And because of the port forwarding, I could now access the website that was running on an adjacent Docker container. And, as I thought, it was Docker SSH over HTTP. So, what I did now is quite simple. I just installed Docker on that Docker container, so we are not anymore in the WordPress container. We are now in another Docker container that is serving that website. I installed Docker on that, and on that uh, Docker container and I did PS. PS is the Docker command to see what Docker containers are running on that system. Apparently, the system that was running the Docker SSH was the Docker host, the target machine we were trying to have access to from the first slide. So, there is a container on Docker Hub and it just does one simple thing. If your Docker container is run as root, it will just mount the volume, your root volume, into the container itself, and you have root access on the machine. Which I did, I just downloaded uh, the, Docker, um, the Docker VM or Docker container, whatever, uh, and I ran it, and then I had root access on um, this container, 
I just uh, did um, a cut of the shadow file to see which users were there. Uh, it was apparently whale and root, so I changed passwords on both. And then I just logged in to the container, and as you can see here, I uh, logged in as whale. I switched users to root. I just used the root password I set, and now I am root in the container. It's quite easy. You don't need a lot of experience. So my ending thoughts is this. Basic pen testing is really not that hard. There are a lot of tools that automate stuff for you. You don't even need any programming experience. You all, all you need is Google. Uh, most of the time, pen tests, the easy pen tests, are just due to simple misconfiguration. Humans, they are lazy, they don't configure things well, and yeah, usually st stupid stuff will, will, will get you into this result. And obviously, yeah, test stuff before you run it into production. And don't code an architect in monolith. Why I say this is because bugs can happen, especially in big applications. It's way easier to fix a bug when it's uh, micro-segmented than try and fix it in a, in a monolith, fix one thing, break 20 other things. Uh, it's just easier that way. And actually, that's it. Uh, so it was only 30 minutes long. I didn't know how long it would take. So, uh, Any questions about this? Or are you just too afraid to ask? <laughs> okay, then uh, that's it. Thank you very much.